Shabbat Shalom. I'm Robert Barr, and I'm with Sharon Dittmar, Reverend Minister at First Unitarian Church. I am glad you're here. Thank you. Uh, this is actually a pre-recorded service, we should say. You're, this is Christmas Day. You've uh, been busy. Yes. I know you will have been busy. Yes. I know that we're anticipating that. So we recorded this service, and so we can talk about this. But we're going to read our the, the, the service, and we'll talk a little bit about our org, and then we're going to have a conversation about this day, December 25th. Okay. Does it work for you? Yes, it does. Works for me, too. So let the Sabbath be a time for believing in what could be and seeing with new eyes. In this serious world, let us take ourselves less seriously. In these harsh times, let us listen for a soothing word. While the world around us unfolds at an instant, let us judge each other a little more slowly. Let the Sabbath... Oh, I'm sorry. I was just kept on going. It's all yours. I'm... <laughs> What? Just kidding. Let the Sabbath <laughs> shine a light yourself. into a corner of ourselves where hope is renewed. Let us remember a reason to be joyful, a way to be gentle. Let the Sabbath be a time for opening up. Let us find strength in our dreams and trust in our strength. So one of the really neat things about doing these services is working with somebody else. We're, we're, we're not egomaniacal as clergy, but the fact is most of us are used to standing up there by ourselves. It can get lonely and boring. It can, but you don't get interrupted. <laughs> People don't step on your <laughs> That's the thing. It's always hard when you're working with somebody else. And, you know, it's sort of sometimes I just sort of go and it's I've, when you're co-fishing at a wedding or something, yeah. you just sort of keep on talking and the other person... Let's have a fight on Christmas Day about it. Oh, that'll be fun. So it's great having Sharon here. It's great uh, sharing services with you. I'm hoping wherever you are right now on this Christmas Day. It's been a, a wonderful day. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the complexity of it for the mm -hmm. Jewish community. But what's really sort of interesting is our jewishcommunity.org, we're willing to have these conversations. We're not afraid of it. We don't have mm -hmm. to be afraid. There's nothing that we need to fear. As modern religious people, we don't have to be afraid of different ideas. We don't have mm -hmm. to be afraid of changing identities. We should be able to grapple with them. And that's why I wanted to do the service with you because I think it's really important that members of the Jewish community don't feel like Christmas is something that's sort of untouchable and we mm. can't be around because some people respond that way and the fact is many, many members of the Jewish community, interfaith families, we have interfaith mm. members of our family are interfaith. We may, many of us may be sharing, have shared Christmas Eve or Christmas Day with family members mm -hmm. because that's the holiday that, that's the core and parcel to who they are. So that's what's so great about our Jewish community.org. We're, we're willing to explore these things as modern 21st century Jews and we have technology, which means we could pre-record the service uh, because we, we weren't going to be here tonight. It's one of those things, that's the reality. Sometimes we're busy and uh, it's nice still to be together because I'm hoping that next, when, when I post this service, I'll be the one who actually puts it up online at 6 o'clock. If you're watching right now, it's 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. I'm going to watch and listen to the comments. I like, mm -hmm. I like to do that. So the comments become really important. We're all part of this ongoing dialogue, mm -hmm. whether we're watching live or we're watching in archives, and the new format allows us to keep on talking. Mm -hmm. So you get to see the comments after Christmas Day is over. So glad you're here. If you'll start with the candle lighting, I'll read the second part. Night seeps up from the ground, light falls from the stars, distant, icy, ancient beyond all who came before. But the light of the Sabbath is warm, the light of the Sabbath is ours, the light of the Sabbath is of this time, of this place, of lives that know the past only in a dream. As we light these candles, we create a place of warmth. As we light these lights, we welcome this time for reflection. As we light these lights, we stake our claim. And while these lights burn, the time is ours. Baruch HaOr Olam, blessed is the life within the world. Baruch HaOr Adam, blessed is the light within each person. Baruch HaOr Shabbat, blessed is the light of the Sabbath. So, as we said, as I said, it's uh, Christmas Day. Pre-recorded the service, but we're here to talk about Christmas. It's, it's something that you know well. You've been a minister a long time. It's 20 years. Wow. 19, something like that. So, so, well, a couple gonna, decades. A couple decades of, of getting up on Christmas Day. And, and all of us, whether we're Jew, or Christian or Jewish or Unitarians or Muslim, if we're living in, the, in Western culture, mm -hmm. it's Christmas is something that we, in, we bump into. Sometimes we understand it. Sometimes we don't understand it. Sometimes it bothers us. Some people get offended by some aspects of it. If people 
try to impose it. Mm-hmm. But it's part of our culture. It's part of what's around us. So we're going to explore it. So Christmas for you. It's been a busy time. Yes, December is always a very busy season. As a Unitarian Universalist, I'm not a Christian, and the vast majority of my members are not, although I would say a small minority are Christian, very liberal Christian. But this is a real hot topic for us. I think it's not complicated for us in the same ways that it's complicated for um, our Jewish friends, but oh my goodness, is it a hot topic for us. What what makes it hot? Uh, Well, I have members who are atheists, and they're like, why do we have a special service for Christmas? And I'm like, because people want one. Um, <laughs> Do you they know, show up? Do the atheists show up? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. And I've had people say to them, well, you don't have to come. You know, because it's not like it's the regular day. It's usually like an evening service. or Because we, right, be right. we do them on Christmas Eve. Yeah, right, so it'll be Thursday night. Yeah, and some people just want to come out of familiarity. Or as, as you mentioned, there's families of mixed religious faith. Sure. Or grandma wants to come, but, you know, the adult son wants something palatable that's not going to make him choke, you know. And so... They want to hear a story of hope, too. This is the reason people also come. They want some kind of hope. I mean, you know, it's the shortest day of the year. It's like, throw us a bone. It's tough out here, you know? (laughs) Throw us a bone. It's Christmas. I I really think that's that's how people feel. But my members, sometimes, like, they, too, have felt assaulted by Christianity or consumerism or both. Hmm. And I do have members who also grew up Jewish or in other faiths or, you know, in no particular faith. Right. And so that's also hard for them. They feel assaulted by the season. And so, I'm sympathetic to that. So do you, you know, do you, do you adultification? Do you have a conversation hmm. about that? What kind of, I mean, that's interesting. Well, you know, it kind of flares up, let's put it that way, uh-huh. you know. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what are you thinking? Um, Okay. How does it... Go ahead. We have a music program. I'll I'll just tell you something that's funny straight out of our current canon. We have a music (laughs) worship program in December every year. We have one in in May or June, too. And almost every year, the conversation is this. Whatever we do, we cannot do Christian music, okay? Because we're tired of it. There's going to be a lot of it. There's going to be a Christmas Eve service. So we've tried to do, like, every other kind of December possible music that you could. so, 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 So that would be, like, oh, holy note of... That's yeah, a, that's yeah. A crazy yeah but, people are like, but White Christmas is not. No, White Christmas would be out too. So you really, know, oh yeah, because it mentions Christmas. Yeah, so someday it's, it's Christmas like by Stevie Wonder, the, the the new the Apple commercial. That's it. All be out. Oh, anything. Oh, got it. Got it. I thought it was secular. Okay, got no, it. All of it, just like, and so, and then this year. It was so funny. I said to the music director, well, in my 18 years here, we've never had a music program mid-December that was just Christmas music. 18 years. And I was like, well, why don't we, why don't we try it this year? And she's like, well, it's fine by me. It's certainly easier. I mean, the music is everywhere. Right, right. So I say, what do it's you a, do in December that's not Christmas? Who knows what my long-suffering music directors have been doing for the last 18 years. One year we did do a Mall in the Night Visitor, which is Christian, but huh. many others were not. They were not. There was the Kwanzaa program. There, I mean, oh. believe me, we've tried everything else. And and, and and then, you know, so some people loved it and some people were offended by it. Really? It's inevitable. Yes. Wow, wow, wow. It's interesting. So it's 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 because the Unitarian movement, because of where it's at, the, the Jewish community, we don't do in a synagogue, you wouldn't do Christmas. Yeah, you just you, you wouldn't just wouldn't have do that. it. It's just not just part of the deal. <laughs> we're we're certainly here more much more comfortable with the, the idea of multiple identities and interfaith families and we do the chronic of Christmas cards. But it's not our holiday, so there would right. be no. I mean, we have we have our winter holiday, sure. Hanukkah. We do that, so we don't have to even struggle with no. that. We can talk about it in the. If you looked at the Hanukkah guide that we produced, it's still available. If you go to Cincinnati OJC, we did talk about families that do both Hanukkah and Christmas, and and things about how to how to shape them. But we would never bring it into the synagogue in that way. I mean, right. that, that not I can't. It, Maybe in 25 or 100 years, there'll be another iteration of this. I will no longer be the rabbi, so don't complain. <laughs> but but it's interesting. It's not a uh, it's not an issue for us. But I never thought about the Unitarians having that struggle. And I, you know, I'm sympathetic uh, uh, for my members and others. Y- mm. You know, for example, I recently went to um, a holiday party. Um, that was not through my church. I went with a friend. Um, and 
you know, at that holiday party, it was assumed everyone was Christian and everyone at the party was told Merry Christmas. And I just thought, wow, we live in a pretty big and diverse world. I would not necessarily assume everyone at this party was a Christian or celebrated Christmas. Right. I mean, you know, just say happy holidays. Right. Yeah. And, and, that, and, it's interesting. and then, then, then some people will say, well, that's a war on Christmas. I, I don't understand yeah, so. why being inclusive is, is. Yeah, it's just being welcoming. Being welcoming. And I think it's interesting. It's certainly the, isn't, I mean, the theme of the holiday. Certainly, we were talking before before you know the, the, right now you think about you know the idea of the the refugee the child yes. right the the Joseph and Mary trying to find a place to go to yeah. to give birth to their child not welcome being pushed around and it's interesting i'm i'm curious uh it, it's certainly without much work it's pretty easy to talk about that story and the complications and the complexity yeah. of the Amer the world right now where refugees are moving around the world in numbers that haven't been seen really since World War II. Flooding into Greece, Greece. and Turkey and, and not having a place to go. You know, and then the conversation about America and yeah. whether or not we're going to accept refugees. The reality is we are accepting refugees. The reality is the refugees that, that are being accepted have been in a vetting process for two to three or four years. Some mm -hmm. of them have been in camps for almost to 10 years now. So the conversation Conversations, but it's the rhetoric which is sort of interesting to me because I think a lot of people sort of do the political conversation and they miss the religious story, which I find very interesting. Yeah, and here is the power of religious story. So I actually love religious story. It's one of the reasons I really enjoy Judaism. We have such a rich tradition of story and in interpretation. I love how any significant story has like 500. <laughs> in I love it. You can see what the rabbi in this century and that century. I love it. Right. Um, and what a rich way to do it. But the stories were created, I think, to make meaning. And so if you look at the story of Jesus, you know, as someone once said to me, it doesn't take a stretch of the imagination to say, even if this specific story isn't true, at some point a baby was born and there was no place for that baby to be born. Happens that all the time now. The parents were maybe unmarried or young or displaced or poor. And then what does that mean? I mean, that really calls for me personally in a major way for some awareness Awareness and some compassion. And to me, that's also part of the power, I would say, of the Christmas story. I don't believe in, that Jesus is my source of salvation, so I don't share that with some of our Christian friends. But the story of the birth of Jesus is certainly still compelling to me in that way. Oh, it's a powerful story. I mean, one of the great things, and I always thank you for it, was getting to preach <laughs> at, 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 at First Church. Actually, I'm going to be, po it's, it's, I'm posted online right now. Go to, to ourjewishcommunity.org. Uh, go to well, actually our Facebook page. I posted it on the Facebook page, and it's on our Jewish community, uh, the sermon I gave. And, and, and it, was, it, was, it was fun because I always imagined getting to do that. But I really thought about the the writers of the myth, and and because I see it as a myth, obviously. Mm -hmm. Why did they choose a child born in poverty versus yeah. a child born in wealth? Because there are other stories of 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 you know you think of of other stories where you could have if you were going to create a story you could have created the most the wealthiest of people, sure. right? And I think wh whoever did that. There was that piece about what does it mean to be under un, underprivileged or unprivileged and living in society, a marginalized person. Why did they want to explore that and explore and then to say out of that comes salvation, which yes. is a very, I mean, it is, if you look at the story metaphorically, which is how I do and, and how, how you do as well, it becomes an interesting contrast about that. And then we bring it to the 21st century. Where we're still debating some of these very, very same issues. Yes. And there are classes, they're not the same classes that existed back in, in, in the ancient cl social classes, I mean, and how we're interacting with each other and the friction between them and, and marginalization and the displaced person and how we understand it. I, I have to imagine liberal colleagues of ours are going to be giving many social action sermons based upon Christmas. And I got to imagine that there are going to be some places, some churches are going to be very upset. Yes. That people are going to say you're taking religion out of it, you're making it, yeah. And, and because somehow they see the story not related to today, they see the story to real time. Yes, to real time. <laughs> it's it's out of time. It's both. So it's it's a very it's a really interesting um, sort of complex relationship we have, and I think there's I, I, it's it, it's. The complexity makes it interesting. I, it, it, I think it's fascinating. Yeah, and I, you know, I love the story of Jesus for many reasons, and one is that in this tiny baby who is babies, if you've had a baby, been around a baby, they are helpless. They need you. 
they could die quickly. Um, and yet this baby is this seed of love and of hope. So in this vulnerability is also great power. And I love that, you know, right. so because the story also contrasts the power of might and of army, um, you know, so the story very much sets us up in two of the Gospels. Only two of the Gospels in the New Testament contain the story of the birth of Jesus, and they don't agree, actually, on what they tell you about the story of the birth of Jesus. You could read for yourself. Um, hmm. Yes, there's two different stories. Right. One has the angels, the others have the wise men, and they're not in both stories, so... The Gospels are like that. They don't always agree. Hmm. What does that mean? We could wonder about that. What? Oh. Which I have. <laughs> so, um, but I, I think, you know, and so people living under siege, right? And so to me, then, I also do make a parallel today. Well, we have um, a lot of our Muslim friends living under siege, right. whether they are living in a war-torn country in the Middle East, whether they are struggling to get to sanctuary and safety in Europe, whether they are under siege and treated poorly here in the United States because they are a Muslim and people are afraid, you know, and how war breeds a kind of intolerance and a displacement and a like a bureaucracy of ideas about people instead mm -hmm. of like a care and compassion and a safety and warmth and humanity. And then what are we called to do? You know, what spirit are we called to live into this? Mm -hmm. um, and, and to me, this is a question I would ask of, for myself of any group that was being persecuted. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this would apply. Right. At any time. And, and that is something I take away from the story right. of Jesus. Well, and and, and it's, it's there. And I think for the Jewish community, the conversation is certainly we've been a displaced people. Yes. And so, you know, what's our response? So the yeah. one and, and this is where I think religion, good religious stories and good meaning powerful religious stories that are timeless intersect with reality, yes. right? That that if you look at them as metaphor, we can read them, they, they speak to a human condition that has existed over time. And as Jews, we've experienced that displacement, and so how do we deal with the displacement we're seeing now? Yes. As Christians who read the story as metaphor, you're, you're seeing that piece of the story and say, so, so what does it mean to us? As Jews, we read the story of the Passover exodus from Egypt, which didn't happen, but we do know slavery has happened and people have been marginalized. It's it's when stories, a uh, myth is strong and touches a human component that hopefully it motivates us to be able to do it. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people separate that. I think I sometimes they, they say, oh, those are nice stories, and that's my religion. Yeah. But somehow they don't connect it to how they live their lives out, on a daily basis. It's like they come to church or they come to synagogue, but somehow they don't Or they intersect. can't they can't extend the story to see that it would apply to any human in that situation. So I also think the story of the birth of Jesus is about a, mi a persecuted minority. I mean, that's yeah. very clear in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of uh, uh, Matthew. You know, well, there's persecuted minorities in every generation. Mm -hmm. What what are we called then to be like or to do? Or, you know, how do we care for their babies? I mean, I just think that these are really relevant human questions. Right. Lift it up for me in this story right. of the birth of Jesus right. and his struggle for life. And then also, you know, it is a story about the triumph of love over power. Mm -hmm. How wonderful, you know, that we don't need to feel hopeless if we feel that we are being crushed by the forces of power or greed or control or, or um, cruelty, that, it, that that might not be forever, that there is still hope. I right. just think that's a marvelous story. Right, and, 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 and which is interesting because we're beginning, we seem to be, certainly in America, living in a time where getting out of poverty is getting harder. Yes, we're and, losing the middle class. Right, and, 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 it's, and, and, and I think this is <laughs> one of the things that I, is inspiring about the, the story of, of, of Christmas is the idea that Every child born has the potential to become anything. That's yes. sort of that's that's sort of granular in the Absolutely. story, right? And yet, and I think some of us we still want that and we hope for that. And the question is, are we making sure the societies we live in actually allow for that? Absolutely. And when I think of the rhetoric we hear in the United States right now, if you live here, you know what I'm talking about, anti-immigrant, whatever it is, if you're Hispanic or Middle Eastern or whatever, the, the anti-immigrant, and and you know. 
it's just crazy to me because I also see Jesus, you know, he's be, his family's being asked to move so they can take count of him here. Is he like a displaced person, an immigrant, a refugee? What is he? And it's, it's almost like people just disconnect the story they grew up with as like a story, as you were saying, that would have relationship to their life and an idea of civility and discourse and how we might want to make choices, better choices today. Right, right. Because, you know, it's interesting because you know, my grandparents were immigrants. All but one of my grandparents was immigrants. And in my office, in my study, I actually have like my grandfather's book, How to Become a Good American. Oh. And it, it, it was, and I, I have to show it to you. You probably, you might know the society out of which, it, that literally uh, some society. And so there's, there's Christian's overtones in it. But oh. he didn't become, but it's about, you know, being, how to be a gentleman and what America, it was, it's fascinating. Were they trying to like culturate him to be a Christian? No, 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 no. no. I think okay. it was, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't like he grew joined a group, but it was like a book he bought in a store about like, proper behavior and things like that. Do they shake hands here? Do they? Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, he didn't speak yeah. English. I have his English, yeah. I have his Russian English picture. And you sit there and you go, so, you know, what's it like when, and, and, and I don't think of myself as an immigrant, but the reality is my roots are not very deep. Yeah, unless right? you're part of the First Nation or First Persons, we're all immigrants. We're here all, in the right. States. And, and, yeah. and, and it's really, you know, so we have, this, I mean, actually, in, in one of the things, uh, we we have one or two things that came from the old country, because they they were my my grandmother who I, my great grandmother who I was named after. Um, I have some vase that my mother had kept because she, and I have it, and it's and it speaks to you know it's not that distance. So the story about being marginalized, being displaced, having to find a place to live, and how that f plays in, I think there's there's power and beauty in it. And uh, it's interesting. I, I, I just wonder how Christmas will resonate this year with many people, given the conversations that are taking place, certainly in, in the United States. I wonder, too. I wonder about that a lot. But I see people in the United States kind of uh, separated into their camps, unable to hold a diversity of ideas at the same time. I, I find us also um, oddly anxious right now. Um, I'm not sure what people are so afraid of. Uh, I feel like the other the, well they are but I personally feel like the most frightening thing I have done is the same thing I've done for the last 35 years which is get in a car and drive it and that has not changed in 30, I mean statistically that's the most frightening thing right I do. right but we but we yeah we think it we don't think about those things we think yeah, but we, it's the that's the scary thing I do right. every day and everything else is um, right. possible so was your not. so the sermons you preached last night hopeful Oh, uh, okay. So one was a Charlie Brown Christmas pageant, and then. So are you Lucy? Did you pull it? Oh goodness, you no! Would, if I was playing Charlie Brown, you would have pulled the ball <laughs> away from me, wouldn't you? I know I you. Wish. I knew you would have done that. Um, I, I am, <laughs> I am the director and the prompter. Prompter is very important for children's plays, um, and then the the. For the, for the evening, I'm going to use a text from Matthew, and I'm really focusing on Joseph as a man who had compassion for not, you know, tossing Mary to the corner, because apparently she's pregnant. And then... Um, and, With somebody and, else's child. Yeah, that's what we are told in the um, Gospels. And then um, I think I want to use a, a writing from David Foster Wallace about This is Water, which is about compassion and, and, and really, you know to be compassionate in our faith. You know, the depth of the beauty of this story is the vulnerability and the tenderness and the compassion as, as it comes together and how uh, this family cares for itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether you believe that God is in this story or not, um, to me, that is mm -hmm. certainly the most motivational and beautiful thing about it. And, and mm -hmm. you know, it is a reason for hope. Right. And, and to prevail in the midst of suffering, mm -hmm. that's also part of this story, too. That's that's great. I'm sure I know your members will enjoy it and find depth in it. I've heard you preach before. <laughs> and the ones who don't want to hear about it on Christmas, maybe they just won't come. Well, they'll just tell me to send them here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they should come here. They can go at 6 o'clock. They're going to be watching. No, they're not going to want to even hear talk about Christmas. They're going to be like, I'm so tired of it. I know, but there's, and I get that every once in a while. Yeah. It, it can be overwhelming, but, but I think we talked about it differently. I don't yeah. think we talked about it like everyone else is talking about it. So there's the possibility of hearing a new version of sure. it. And I think that, that, that it's, it's part of learning and growing. And I can understand being a little bit resistant, but I yeah. like what you preached. And I think uh, opening up and sure. seeing the beauty and seeing the wonder and not being quite so afraid. Yeah. And uh, realizing that we've all, every one of us at some moment in our lives probably has been marginalized and has been the yes. other. And what will we choose when we see someone else being marginalized? Right. Where will we stand? Right. And what did we want when we were? Mm -hmm. Because it is about action, isn't it? Yes. Wow. 
So I'm delighted you were here. Thank you for sharing this Christmas day with us, though. <laughs> we did it early, obviously. Thank you for being here for the service with us as well. We're going to read the, uh, 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 the challah, which uh, is here. So if you'll read the challah. All right, the whole thing. Yeah, and then I'll read the whole one. Okay. Thing. Yeah, you, trip over oh, there. I didn't trip over. Oh, that's right. We didn't get our cues right. From the earth, a seed harbored in darkness, from the heat and cold and wet and dry, to wind and air and rain. Golden ground, flour from wheat, with water and yeast active and alive. Always something saved. From the earth, sweetness and salt, from nature tamed, oil and egg. Mixed and rested in darkness and warmth, kneaded smooth, made right by touch. Hands that shape, mouths that want, from the earth our hala, our warmth. Baruch HaMal Kapenu, blessed is the work of our hands. Baruch HaZon HaAdam, blessed is the vision of our minds. Baruch Lechem HaAretz, blessed is the bread of the earth. And then if you have some wine or juice, please feel free to join me. We lift the cup together as a tribute to our past, as a blessing for our future. May the allure of its untold flavors beckon us forever to keep uncovering new branches, new roots that hold us together. Tonight, as we welcome the Shabbat, may we find time to spend in our own quiet company and listen to the calling of our hearts. Bruchim ha'hayim ba'olam, blessed is a life within the world. Bruchim ha'hayim ba'adam, blessed is a life within us. And so we say, l'chayim. L'chayim. So I'm delighted that you're here sharing the Shabbat with us. Uh, whether you watch us at 6 o'clock or you watch us in archives, I hope those of you who celebrate Christmas or had Christmas experiences with family and friends had a wonderful time. I hope your Christmas was wonderful Thank and you. relaxing and that you can put your feet up and enjoy. And that they're warm. And they're warm. warm they always feet. get cold on Christmas Eve. They do? because That's good. what you're, if, if that's what ministers are thinking about. It's been a long day. My feet are cold, cold. Okay. on Christmas Eve. <laughs> got it. Got it. There's, there's a secret that you can share. Shh. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> it's just between all of us, okay? <laughs> so go to our Facebook page, our JewishCommunity.org, our Facebook page. It will tell you about the next service. Next service is January 6th. First service, it will be pre recorded. Uh, but, but again, even if it's pre recorded, it still is going on at 6 o'clock. You can chat with each other, so we're glad you're here. Uh, check out our JewishCommunity.org, our website, see what's going on there. If you can make a donation before the end of the year, please do so. Your support really helps more than just the money, which obviously is important. When you send in whatever you can, it also is an affirmation that what we're doing here speaks to you. It allows others who support us to know that they're not alone. It's about a sense of belonging. It's about a sense of community. It's about a sense of saying that this is an important institution whose voice needs to be heard. So we're glad you're with us. I'm delighted that we share this night together, uh, this uh, uh, Christmas Day and this Shabbat. And then we close with the final words, may we know blessings those who are near, may we know blessings those who are far, and may the Sabbath bring its goodness to everyone soon, wherever they are. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.